So you've heard a little bit about ICANN today. We are this coalition of international NGOs and specialist groups. And our emphasis is on shared learning, on companion animal population management, but also disseminating our learnings to the wider field. So one of our earliest projects was to establish our shared knowledge on how to implement dog population management, so actually what you do with dogs, and then to distill that into this guidance document. And we published that in 2007. So looking back at this document, much of it has stood the test of time, not least the concept of approaching DPM humanely, but also taking time to understand your local dog population before you jump into management action. Because just replicating what has worked elsewhere may not work for your community. So dog populations, we know, are strongly influenced by what people do, the responsibilities and restrictions they place on the dogs that they own, the resources they do or do not provide to their dogs and to unowned or community dogs, their level of tolerance and care towards roaming dogs, and of course the suitability of the environment, the physical environment, to supporting roaming dogs safely, and of course a difference in zoonotic diseases. So all of that changes a lot between location. So your DPM design needs to be a thoughtful and tailored process. So despite those consistencies, after 12 years, we felt it was necessary to do an update. We had enough to share. So ICAM members and their partner organizations had learned a lot in the intervening years, in particular about the importance of changing and supporting responsible behavior. So not rushing in and doing things to dogs as if they are wildlife. So this is as much a people issue as it is a dog issue. Um, we would also learned a lot about community engagement and its role in intelligent design and sustainability. We would learned a lot about gaining community, sorry, a government responsibility for dog population management from the outset and the concerted advocacy required to do that. And we would learned a bit more about how to assess dog populations so you can understand them and their communities better. So today is the formal launch of this 2019 update. So you can find it on our website. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a heavy lift. <laughs> um, it has associated videos to help you explore the content, just one at the moment, but we have some more coming on in the next few weeks and months. And we do have some uh, hard copies, inspection copies over on the ICAM desk, so you can go and feel the weight of it. Okay, so the document is structured into these five sections, an introduction and four chapters, and I'm just going to briefly run you through those chapters and, and highlight some key points. Okay, so chapter one includes the first sort of new edition for this 2019 uh, update. It's an exploration, an explicit exploration of dog population dynamics. So a dynamic system of subpopulations, okay, of subpopulations and um, of subpopulations and, and dynamic processes um, that together DPM needs to work to influence in order to change the population in a targeted way and hence have a positive impact on uh, dog-related problems such as welfare concerns, dog bites, and zoonoses. So. To help us explore dog population dynamics, we've used this graphic, which is a simplified representation. So just to explain that graphic a little bit more, I'll just highlight its major parts. So each of the dog icons is a different subpopulation of dogs. And you can see inside that road icon, we have four different major subpopulations of dogs that can be found roaming on our streets. But why bother to consider how these dogs are categorized, how they're defined? Well, in order to influence these dogs, their numbers, their density, their welfare, we need to understand where they come from, what are their various sources, and also understand what dynamic processes may help them to turn into a different subpopulation in future. So how is a community dog in the future going to become an owned, confined dog? 
So the arrows are the dynamic processes that we need to consider. Things like purchasing of dogs, adoption, relinquishment, abandonment, confinement, roaming. Our job, getting terrible feedback, our job as DPM implementers is to identify and to understand those processes and the human behaviours that drive them. So that through our DPM system, what we're able to do is to nudge, promote, block, or to interrupt these dynamic processes in some intelligent way. So understanding the utility of this um, is the subject of chapter one. So chapter two provides guidance on building an evidence base so that DPM can be designed and adapted wisely helping to establish a clear vision. What are the priority problems and therefore the desired impacts of your DPM intervention? Making sure this is done with input from a range of stakeholders, not least the citizens that live with and among these dogs, using community engagement and involvement. But also understanding dog population dynamics, but as far as is reasonable. So we recognise that the research efforts required to understand the nuances of all dynamic processes and subpopulations of dogs is beyond the reach of nearly all of us. But we can be explicit about what we do know and what we don't know, what has to remain an assumption as we start our intervention, and then we can commit to monitoring and evaluation as we progress. And that allows us to test those assumptions as opposed to working blindly day after day on our DPM work. So one of the annexes to chapter two is this detailed list of potential methods that you can use during initial population assessment to gather some of this valuable data. Um, this also references some of the practical guidance that you find from ICAM's Are We Making a Difference guide, which I'll talk more about in my presentation tomorrow. Okay, chapter three is where the action happens. This is where we give guidance on what you actually do to manage dogs. And you'll see here that we've split that DPM system, the work that we do, into foundations and services. Okay, so the foundations are those things that we have seen as core to creating sustained DPM systems. Legislation and enforcement, a task force to lead the effort with the benefit of multiple stakeholders. Concerted advocacy to inspire and maintain political will and the resources required to run the interventions. And community engagement. This is a concept that is growing in emphasis in our field and something we'll be hearing a lot about at this conference. We've all experienced the challenges of sustainability. So what we wanted to do is to start emphasising what we can do to keep our humane DPM interventions and systems working for the long term. DPM should be considered a permanent community service. This is not a three-year project where at the end of the period there's no dogs and the problems are solved and we can all go home. As long as there are dogs owned by citizens, you're going to need to manage their populations. Now, how that is done will change over time, with increasing emphasis on owner responsibilities and care responsibilities, but it can't ever cease. We've also split the DPM services into what we've been calling fundamental services that are critical to all effective DPM systems and context-dependent services that are not always required, but there will be a time and place when they become important to implement. So for the DPM services that we've categorised as essential, we included promoting responsible behaviour, not least in dog owners, strengthening the DPM professional capacity, including the veterinary community, access to affordable reproduction control and access to affordable veterinary care. And then those services that may not be essential to all DPM systems at all times, but can become important when and where dog population dynamics demand them, include this formal education of children in schools, rehoming centres and holding facilities, which are not essential all the time, but there will be a time when they are suitable, identification and registration, control of commercial breeding and sale, and managing access to resources, not just reducing, but managing them thoughtfully. 
So assessing your local dog population, which is what chapter two is all about, allows you to select the most suitable DPM services for now and to implement these wisely with an understanding of the human behaviors, motivations, and barriers that are driving those dynamic processes that we're focused on. For each service, we've identified the desired outcomes of that service, and we've also described what we're calling considerations. So those are things to keep in mind when implementing services, and we've included case studies throughout the document to bring some realism to the content, so it's not all just theory. Now, our primary audience for this guidance is DPM implementers. So it's the local governments, municipalities, communities, NGOs that are doing the hard work. So these are the people that must understand their dogs and manage them humanely and wisely. But what about those people that influence DPM implementers? National governments, international um, IGOs, regional bodies, international and national NGOs. We identified a number of ways that this type of organization can support DPM implementers, making the environment supportive and conducive to the implementers doing their good work. And this is what the fourth and final chapter is all about. So, please do go onto our ICAM website, download the guide, take a look at our dog population dynamics animation. You can also browse through one of those inspection copies on the table up there in the tent. I did want to say thank you to the ICAM members, partner organizations, and DPM experts, many of which are in this room, who I pursued for the last two years for the input for this update. So this comes from you guys, not just from in here. So thank you for your help. And uh, thank you to you guys for listening to me today. <laughs>